Hi, this is Greg Bray with Inspiring Doubt, and this is our first interview with author Guy P. Harrison, uh, who has come to join us. He's coming in uh, through or, or from San Diego today. Now, I invited uh, Guy Harrison or, or Mr. Harrison to be on the show because uh, he was a big influence for my personal advance into skepticism. And as I was sort of discovering a lot of the questions that I was having, um, his book here. 50 Reasons People Give for Believing in a God was uh, one of the ones that was so influential to me that I've actually bought uh, dozens of copies of it and I give it out to people. <laughs> um, it's, uh, I think, a fantastic book, but um, we have, um, uh, of course, or he has several books that have been released. The most recent one is a book called Think, Why You Should Question Everything. Um, so, Guy, thank you for joining me, and um, it's a pleasure to have you on the show. Yeah, thanks for inviting me. Glad to be here. So, I guess first things first, you are an author. You've written now five books uh, on this subject, including race and reality, right? Yeah. Um, and Think is your most recent book. This is the, the first one other than race and reality that, that departed from the, the sort of structure of the 50 questions um, or 50 statements. Um, I, I like this book. I've been rereading it over the last few days, um, and, and I think it's uh, an excellent guide for skepticism. Of course, here with Inspiring Doubt, that is our goal, is to promote critical thinking and, and scientific uh, analysis of the world around you, or thinking like a scientist. And that seems to be the, the goal of this book as well. Can I ask you what inspired you to write this book specifically? Yeah, it, it's simple. Uh, I look around the world, I've traveled far and wide, I've met all sorts of people in high places, low places, and I see a consistent problem throughout humanity, weak skepticism. And I, you know, I've hit that theme repeatedly in my writing and coming at it from different angles, and I said, you know, I need to write just one book that I can hand to anyone. It's an all-purpose general guide to how to be, how to become a good skeptic, how to think like a scientist in everyday life. And this is that book. I worked really hard to keep it nice and thin. You know, it's not a thick book. It's easy to read. It, some, of the, some of the topics are complex and challenging, but I, I struggled. I worked my butt off to, make them, to, to write about them in a way that a high school kid could easily grasp and, 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 and feel, hopefully feel inspired. And when they close the book, they, I, I want people to close this book after reading it and say, you know what? Wow, I'm going to be a good skeptic. I'm going to work at it. I'm, I'm not going to be a sucker. I'm not going to be a victim if I can help it. Because as I say in the book, it doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter how innately intelligent you may be. It doesn't matter how wonderful your educational accomplishments may be. If you are a human being with a human brain, then you've got one foot in fantasy land and you are set up. <laughs> to believe in nonsense and to be constantly fooled when it comes to perceiving reality and what's not reality. So this book gives people, one, the tools. The, it shows you how you can really uh, put the, the skills of a good skeptic into play in your everyday life. And it also, like I said, hopefully inspires people to care about their brain and keep weeding it to keep the nonsense out. Because when you're a good skeptic, there's no guarantees in life. Anything bad can always happen. But if you're a good skeptic, you are more likely to lead a much more efficient, safer, and productive life. Thank you. That's uh, really well put. Um, that I, I certainly appreciate that. I'd, I'm going to ask, though, can you elaborate a little bit more on weak skepticism? That's something that you've uh, covered quite a bit in your books. But what do you mean by weak skepticism yeah. as opposed to how, what you promote? Yeah, the reason I always say, you know, strive to become a good skeptic instead of just be a skeptic, or because we're all skeptics. We're all skeptical to some t degree. Okay, I, I've met people who believe a hundred crazy things, but when it comes to UFOs, ah, no way, I'm not falling for that nonsense. You know, we all have, no matter who you are, <laughs> no matter who, who the person is, there, there's going to be some things they believe that might be a little irrational, and there's going to be other things they're forcefully skeptical about. For example, just look at religion. Some of the best skeptics I have met when it comes to Christianity are Muslims. They rip the Bible up. They've, got, they've really looked into it, and 
vice versa, some of the best skeptics of Islam that I've ever met are Christians. You know, <laughs> so when I, when I talk about being a good skeptic, one of the one of the things is you have to be consistent. You have to apply it to everything because we're we're vulnerable. We're weak when it comes to authority figures. If our parent tells us something is true, we're inclined to believe it. And most times, that's probably a good idea. But sometimes we even have to question mom and dad, especially later in life. Maybe when you're off on your own, you got to think for yourself. Um, tradition is a big thing. Just because it's always been done this way doesn't mean it's right or true. Popularity is a big problem. You know, truth and reality cannot be determined by popular vote. Okay, a lot of times the majority is just plain wrong. So all these things you got to keep in mind. And when I say be a good skeptic, it's kind of an ongoing process. You're never quite there. You're always working at it. And I, sh I should mention another good, another important, uh, a key to being a good skeptic is you got to keep an open mind. I, I, sh I work at that all the time, and it's hard. It's hard. Because you get to a point, you think you've got it all figured out. You know, this is nonsense, that's nonsense. But no, that you've got to keep an open mind because you never know. The history of scientific discovery shows us that the weirdest stuff can turn out to be true. So you've got to keep that mind willing to change. You know, if better evidence comes along, you've got to let go of your conclusions. You've got to change. Changing your mind is not a weakness. It's not a fault. It's the sign of being a good skeptic and a wise person. And you mentioned trying to write a book that's sort of easy to read, and, and that's one thing that I, I really love about all of your books, actually. It's the reason that I, I purchase copies of them to give out to other people is because, frankly, there's a lot written on this subject in general or on more specific parts of it. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm looking at a, a shelf full of very esoteric uh, descriptions, and even things... Uh, I've got a couple books by Michael Shermer, which I love and I've, I've uh, recommended to other people, and... They just seem to bristle at them to, to some extent. And that's I really appreciate that about your style. You share a lot of personal stories. You write in a very approachable manner. Uh, and try not to be in your face or derogatory uh, when it comes to uh, these beliefs. And, and frankly, I, I love the way that you even share some of your own personal uh, misgivings or, or uh, I guess missteps um, throughout your development as well. I love the story from the beginning of your... Uh, your first one, where there are sorry, not your first, your your most recent book, think, um, where you talk about uh, believing in space aliens, is that, and and then you go on. I think that's uh, I love when you you bring that sort of back around and give the example of Gretchen uh, later on, uh, the the fictional story uh, that you. Let, let me let me note just for my own fragile ego, I was only ten years old at the time. Okay, <laughs> <laughs> I didn't fall for it yesterday. But yeah, that, that, that incident, ha I think, influenced me. It was part of the process of me, you know, questioning things because as a child I saw this documentary, Chariots of the Gods, the, the TV documentary, and it blew me away because all this, you know, evidence was there and it looked so compelling and convincing. And about a few months later I saw another documentary on PBS. It was one of the NOVA programs that just ripped it all to shreds and a light went off in my head. I went, aha, wait a minute. So if there's a guy on TV wearing a tie and he has a fancy title, doesn't necessarily mean he knows what he's talking about every time. You know, you have to you have to slow down and think about these things. So that was one little step along the way in my process. And of course, uh, it leads to the question you bring about you bring up the uh, guy in a, a fancy suit and tie, um, not necessarily having all the answers. The same is true of an author that writes a book. Uh, of course, I shared on on Facebook and a couple other uh, social media platforms pr promoting the the interview that uh, I'm doing with you here. And several people looked at the the title for your book. And I should ask, uh, did you choose your own title, or was that a publisher uh, decision? For think. For think, and then of course the, it's actually the subtitle that people. Uh, I it would. I feel I'd be remiss to not uh, mention the the irony that everybody perceives in your subtitle and why you should question everything. Yeah, well, you should question everything. Even me saying you should question everything, question that too. You know, yeah. You know, I can't even remember. I go round and round with these publishers all the time. I think think was definitely my my suggested title. I, why you should question everything? I think was theirs. I can't I can't remember now exactly because I usually whenever I whenever I propose a book, I do a few suggested titles and then they tell me to shut up and they put what they want on it. You know, I, who am I? I'm just the author. You know, but but um, 
Yeah, I can't remember exactly. But, uh, yeah, I've heard all sorts of things. Of, you know, well, I'm skeptical of your skepticism. And so I'm like, great, man, be skeptical of everything. That's one, that's one of the things in all my books. Somewhere in there, it's worked in pretty plain to see, where I say, look, I'm not telling you what to believe, how to think. I'm trying to inspire you and show you how to think for yourself. Okay, that's a constant theme in my writings and my work. I want people to go off on their own and be better thinkers for their own good. Okay, I'm not, I, I'm not some guy claiming to have the universe figured out, to have some ultimate truth, nothing like that at all. I'm just saying, stop trusting everything you hear and everything you're told. Stop trusting your fragile human brain that leads you astray more times than you can imagine. I mean, our brains are loaded with these processes that just, just like, make us bumbling idiots in many circumstances throughout life. And it's nothing to be ashamed of. doesn't mean you're dumb or crazy. It's part of being human. It comes with the territory. But if, if you've got to be aware of this, you know? If I saw a ghost right now in the middle of this interview, you know, it'd freak me out. It'd look completely real. But I would know enough about the human brain to stop short of saying there are absolutely ghosts in the universe. I know that now. I would say no. I said that was a fascinating, you know, event, but I need more evidence because I know an eyewitness account, even my own, is not enough. And, you know, it's also important is, uh, for good skeptics to be humble. You've got to be humble. You've got to know that your mind is fallible. You're not perfect. You're going to make mistakes in your reasoning. You have and you will. And there are things rattling around in your head right now which are probably not true or real, that you think are real. You've got to be humble. I always tell people, if you're, you know, skeptics have this uh, rep of being arrogant jerks. And, you know, among, many believers will say, oh, you people are know-it-alls. You, you think you are. And I always explain, look, man, if a skeptic is arrogant, he ain't doing it right. Okay? <laughs> You've got to be humble. Because a good skeptic, that's the person that says, Man, I don't have all the answers. I don't know what is going on. You know, I'm doing the best I can. I'm trying to figure out what's real, and I'm never quite 100% sure about anything because things change as more evidence comes in. So skeptics, good skeptics, are the most humble people in the world, in my opinion. I, I love that you focus so much on the humility in there as well and the ability to self-reflect and to recognize. I mean, you, this is not something that uh, you, you've approached in the manner of telling other people, but very often it's self-referential or, or we um, in the way that you bring it up. And I, I love that, that it's uh, described in a, a manner of saying everybody has these faults and everybody has these weaknesses. So it's something that we have to work on. Um, yeah, I, I never, I never assume I am smarter than someone just because they have stumbled into an irrational belief that I have been able to avoid. Because, you know, it's sometimes highly intelligent people are more vulnerable to believing nonsense simply because they're so intelligent and their minds work overtime at compiling evidence on one side of the equation. And, you know, because of confirmation bias, they ignore all the evidence that contradicts it. It's just part of being human. So I'm very, uh, I've always been very sympathetic. I, I'm very understanding when it comes to people who believe crazy stuff because, you know, it could be me. It could be you. It could be any of us. Uh, you know, I have to say from personal anecdote here, which is, of course, the most reliable kind of evidence, um, that uh, for me, the, uh, the people that I have been the most impressive with the, the wild beliefs they can hold, to me, have always been the most intelligent people that I, I've met. I'm, there's, yeah, okay, I've run into some people that don't strike me as particularly intelligent that, that can bring about some striking beliefs, but uh, frankly, I see a whole lot more of it, uh, it well... It, Here's my anecdote. One of my very best friends growing up, um, his uh, his family is all incredibly intelligent. I, I mean, we're talking. Um, I I can't even describe. It. His brother got a a 35, which is near perfect score on the ACT, and was you know it just uh, this entire family is uh, incredibly bright. Um, and yet, this person is the biggest conspiracy theorist I know, uh, and everything about it. What, what I've noticed about that is, uh, it, I think at least, his ability to convince other people that he's right is this huge amount of, a, or it's a huge reinforcing factor. Uh, I think being intelligent in many ways uh, is a way that you can talk your way in, or talk other people into believing what you have. And what is more 
confidence building than getting somebody else to say, yeah, you're right. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, like reality is not something to be decided like we decide things in a courtroom. You know, if you have the best lawyer, she or he may be able to present an overwhelming case that wins. But it doesn't necessarily mean it's really what happened. You know, you know what I mean? But it's, it's, yeah, again, it's, it's great you said conspiracy theorists because they, in my experience too, they are the best, man. They, they're some of the smartest people. They just, they will overwhelm you with mountains of evidence. <laughs> they work so hard at it, you know even though there's probably nothing there. And, you know, so, yeah, I, I always back to the theme of, you know, you've got to be humble. And you've got to understand this is not about being uneducated or, or dumb necessarily. Not at all, not at all. It's about being human. So I, I noted from your, uh, your first chapter, you have sort of a bulleted um, endpoint in your, uh, your think book uh, that, says it's good thinking is the, the heading for it. And the very first bullet here is weak skepticism is perhaps the greatest unrecognized global crisis of all. Every day, people waste time, throw away money, suffer, and even die because they failed to think like a scientist. Can I ask you to elaborate on that? Because, of course, as the, the, this show hits, I, as I said, I've been uh, running Inspiring Doubt as a written format for several years now, but this is the first time it's had its own live broadcast. Uh, and I really want to drive in the point uh, with these first couple shows about why skepticism is so important and, and why critical thinking is. So can you uh, flesh that out a bit more? What is, uh, I, I think, the thing that drives you to push this idea and not just accept it for yourself? Yeah, what, what motivated me or drove me or uh, compelled me to get busy and write some books about this subject is some of the things I've seen. A lot of people think the whole issue of promoting skepticism and critical thinking, it's just about debunking psychics or, or arguing about the existence of ghosts, you know, or astrology or Atlantis, you know, things that on the surface at least are fairly benign. But not at all, not at all. I, I have seen people literally suffer. I, I know of people who, I, I know cases where people die as a direct result of being weak skeptics. I've been around the world and I've seen the poorest of the poor squandering their pennies, their few pennies, on stuff that is just total garbage. You know, buying, buying uh, books that explain how they can buy winning lottery tickets by interpreting their dreams. You know, they'll spend a fourth of their paycheck on that book, you know, when they've got five kids to worry about. You know, I've seen this stuff. I... Uh, in the Caribbean, I was in a, st a soccer stadium filled with thousands of people, mostly poor people, as Benny Hinn stood up in a stage, you know, the uh, faith healer preacher guy from the U.S. Mm -hmm. He swooped in on his private jet, and he mesmerized them all, and he sucked up every loose nickel in that stadium and flew away, you know, and I've seen this stuff, and it, and it just breaks my heart. And, I, you know, people uh, who don't, who aren't good skeptics, waste money, risk their good health by, you know, falling for all sorts of medical quackery. Uh, people do horrible things to their children, even though they love their children and they want the best for their children. I'm not talking about bad parents. I'm talking about good parents who love their children but harm their children because they're weak skeptics. I mean, it goes on and on and on. And so I tell people, like, look, for me, this thing is a moral issue. It really is. I mean, I can't look at the world as it is and not speak out. I have to speak up because I, I think there are few things, there are few aspects of humanity that we could make more improvement uh, by spending less money, less effort really, than just raising the level of skeptical thinking in the world. My Gosh, I mean, we could, we could save millions of lives every year, literally, I'm not exaggerating, millions of lives. We could enhance and improve billions of lives, you know, much less time wasted. I mean, there's so many, I could go on and on about it. But yeah, for me, skeptical thinking is an absolute moral imperative. It's, it's, it's the thing. I, I would feel guilty if I just lived my life and I watched all these people floundering around in all this swamp of nonsense, you know, harming themselves and others and I didn't speak out. I'd feel like a dirtbag, so I have to do it. And I have to say that was a, a huge awakening for me as well, was traveling. I, I grew up in the Midwest. I live in Wisconsin, and it's, uh, for me, um, 
pretty benign. I mean, we, we see, uh, I mean, there's a psychic who has her shop set up down the street, uh, psychic readings by Monica, and of course no recording devices are allowed on the premises, and uh, it's by appointment only. But the, I <laughs> always found that ironic, but um, that is the kind of, uh, of weak skepticism that I run into on a regular basis, sort of uh, um, mild and, and generally benign superstitions. But it was uh, not until I traveled while I was going through my undergrad and, and started to see um, the real harms that this can bring about, and, and then of course started reading and learning more about the world as my, my skeptical awakening occurred, and seeing the... Uh, the link between poverty and and I don't know know if I even want to say weak skepticism so much as superstition. Um, I think that extreme poverty uh, is one of the major factors in that, and it's uh, um, a difficult thing, therefore, for us to help with this. Do you have any uh, thoughts of how um, that we can promote skepticism and uh, and good critical thinking? for people in developing countries or uh, other things. I mean, you've, you've been there. You've done this, right? Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. The first thing is what, what you've mentioned already. Talk in plain English. You know, have, have a simple message. It's, it's about the idea, not about wooing people with your, your wonderful phrases and your terminology and all that. Uh, if you're writing short sentences, simple words, it's the power of the idea. I want you to think for yourself. I want you to ask questions. Not for me, but for you. It's good for you. It's good for the world. <laughs> okay? People, anyone, anywhere, can at least understand the message I'm offering. Whether they accept it or not, that's their choice. But you, you don't have to get too fancy about this. Okay? You, you, I, I like to use stories and examples. They're universal. I tell stories. You know, I... I um, even have one in my book, Think. I, I made up a fictional story about a little girl who's brilliant, but she sees a UFO and she gets carried away with it and it ends up messing up her life. You know, and I just, examples like that. And I, I, um, I try to show people how they are so skeptical in some aspects of their life, but in others, they don't even imagine questioning. They don't even think. Your so candy bar is a great one on that. I, I love it. The uh, candy bar analogy when you're talking about uh, yeah, yeah, some today. Yeah, if somebody somebody walked up to you and said, "Hey, here's a candy bar, the best one in the world. This candy bar tastes so good, and it's already been opened." And you and they say, "This will cure cancer, and it tastes better than any candy bar you've ever had. Give me five bucks." Come on, nobody's. Well, most people would say no because they're skeptical, right? Well, that's you got to be. Everything's a candy bar. If somebody comes to you and says, "Hey, this herbal tea." will prevent diabetes. It's a candy bar. It's it's the same old candy bar thing. You've got to be skeptical, man. You've got to ask questions. You know, <clears throat> you mentioned uh, reasons to promote skeptical thinking. You know, just in America right now, people, we talk about, oh, the health care, the problems with health care, the, the recession, the bad economy, unemployment, all these things. Yeah, but we still throw away billions of dollars on just medical quackery alone, you know, 15 to 20 billion dollars a year at least, medical quackery, just in this one country, okay? That's money we could be spending on other things, maybe like books for your children, or maybe real health care, or, you know, I mean, there's, it's just heartbreaking that we waste so much, and what really gets me is that it's just not on the radar, you know, parents don't teach it to their children, Teachers don't teach it in the classrooms, and politicians never mention critical thinking. You know, it's, it's just not on popular culture's radar, and it needs to be. Because, like, like I said, it's it's the great unrecognized global crisis. I I absolutely have to agree. I think that there's a massive amount of harm that comes from it. Um, I, me, I, I guess this is coming a bit from a, a place of privilege. Uh, growing up, I'm college educated. Grew up with, uh, uh, you know, my actually. My grandfather left, left a trust fund that paid for my college tuition, so it was easy for me to uh, get through that uh, portion of my life. Uh, and uh, now, as an adult, uh, I, I have sort of two sides of me. One is the, uh, the compassion, caring uh, side that wants to promote skepticism for what it is, but the other part is, uh, I guess it's a bit of a schadenfreude of uh, getting uh, involved in these different uh, uh, 
conversations and, and seeking out different beliefs that people have um, to, to learn about them and to engage people who actually do believe them directly um, and to ask them why. And I, I think that uh, being charitable and trying to understand it from their perspective uh, can certainly help to uh, at least empathize with how they came about these beliefs. But um, yeah. there's a lot of entertainment value in it as well. And I'm, I hate to say it that way, but it, it's true. So I, I have to ask you, um, it is, do you have a favorite sort of magical thinking that you like to uh, learn about or study, engage, anything like that? Um, oh, they all interest me in one way or another. Probably UFOs. I love, because I love, I, I've always loved space. You know, I'm a Star Trek fan as a child on the original series. You know, I was a big fan. And I think the, uh, the idea of belief in UFOs, you know, I've, I even mentioned in the book, I, I have the mind of a UFO skeptic. I'm not convinced because there's no evidence. But I have the heart of a UFO believer. You know, I want there to be something out there. I think there probably is based on the size of the universe and the opportunities. Um, but there's no reason to believe it. There's no reason to think we're being visited or anything like that because simply nobody's presented any credible evidence. But, uh, yeah, I love thinking about it. And one, one of the things I do is um, I try to do like a bait and switch with a lot of people. Like, uh, for example, cryptozoology. You know, people who are convinced that Bigfoot is out there running around or the Loch Ness Monster is swimming somewhere. I say, you know, yeah, maybe, maybe, could be. You know, and if you find it, let me know. I'll be the first to freak out about it and be happy. You know, I love finding that out, but I don't think it's real. I say, but you know what? Instead of running around in the woods trying to catch Bigfoot, who's probably not there, why don't you get into microbiology or marine biology? Because there's monsters all over this world, and many waiting to be discovered, I'm sure. You know, you talk about the depths of the ocean, what's there. I just read the other day that an estimated one-third of all the Earth's biomass, the whole planet, every living thing on the Earth, about a third of it lives beneath the ocean floor. Okay, not in the ocean, not on the ocean floor, under the muck of the bottom of the seas. That's how much that's how much microbial gunk and life is living down there. I mean it's unbelievable. And we know nothing hardly about what's going on down there. It's just it's a whole nother universe of life. You know, the rainforest. Uh, an entomologist goes into the Amazon rainforest, he comes back with, you know, a hundred new insect species that he has to spend the next year cataloging and naming. I mean, the, the world is so, it's just, there's so many opportunities still for discovery. Even on our own bodies, we are covered in microbes, we've got microbes in us. We still don't even know everything about the ecosystem that is us, humanity. I mean, so... If you're into to new creatures, weird animals, monsters, well, real science has you covered. That's where you want to go. Either become a scientist or become a fan of science and learn about this stuff. You don't need to sacrifice rational thinking to get thrills. You know, you don't, if you're into UFOs, check out the search for extraterrestrial intelligence, SETI. Check out NASA's astrobiology efforts. I mean, real stuff is going on. Probes are exploring other worlds right now. We are looking for life. We may find it. Maybe not, but we might. That's exciting. That has a better chance of a payoff than searching for the Loch Ness Monster. <laughs> yeah, I, I would have to agree there. And I, I uh, noted in your book when you were talking about the, um, the assessment of... Um, of sources and and the confirmation bias that people, especially the true believers and the UFO believers, have, is that things like the or SETI and NASA are and astrobiology are often sort of overlooked in favor of blogs and other various things. I, I, do you have any sort of? I mean, you you talk about heuristics in your book and rules of thumb that make it easy, um, but one of the biggest things that uh, I struggle with running into other people um, that it, it is selection of sources, identifying what is a good trustworthy source and what is probably not as great of an idea to follow. Um, do you have any sort of rules of thumb that you can recommend for that? Yeah, um, more is better generally, but there's not, there's, I'll say this up front, there's nothing foolproof. I don't care if the most distinguished science in the, scientist in the world says something. I always go, wow, that's exciting, but I don't really let it I don't engrave it in stone on my forehead, you know. I don't, I don't go crazy with it because 
uh, one thing, for example, I'm a big fan. I have an academic background in anthropology. I'm a big fan of paleoanthropology, early hominids, and all that stuff. Big fan of it. And every time they find, you know, a tooth or a mandible in Africa somewhere, there's all this media excitement. Oh, it's we're rewriting the whole book now, and ooh, the missing link, and they get all excited. And I get excited, but I always temper it. I always chill out because I say, okay, well, let's see how it plays out over the next few years when the other anthropologists, you know, check it out, see what they have to say. And so you always have to be tentative, no matter what the source is. Now, having said that, there's absolutely, absolutely some sources are better than others. Uh, you know, look, look at what the person, is their, is their area of expertise actually in the thing they're talking about? That's a big problem where people go wrong. They'll say, well, this guy is a scientist. You know, yeah, well, he has a PhD in chemistry. So why is he telling me about psychics? What's the connection here? Why is he trying to convince me psychics are real and you're flaunting his credentials? You know, I don't see the connection there. I'll still listen to him. I'll, listen, I'll show me the evidence, but uh, you got to be careful of that. You know, it's like with, um, uh, with you know, what meteorologists talking about global warming all the time. Well, they're, they're meteorologists. That's not the same as a client, climate scientist. They're different things. So you have to be aware of that kind of stuff. But also, um, uh, you might want to consider the university a person's at. If a person is at, you know, Stanford, they could be nuts, but maybe not. They're probably worth li listening to. If someone is at the Reverend Sung Young Moon's, you know, Mooney University, they might be a brilliant person who's got some reality to share with you, or they might not be. You might want to just be skeptical. So, you know, I'm a little, you know, as I think about it, I'm a little reluctant to say, always trust these people, never trust these people, you know, because as a good skeptic, you just, the way, you know, you keep an open mind, you, you listen to the presentation, you hear the argument, and you let it filter through your brain, and you worry about your own biases, and then you make a you, you got to be a big boy and you make a decision, does this make sense or not? And if it does make sense, even then, it's almost like just a, it, it's a tentative acceptance, okay? Many times, somebody will present me with some, say some medical quacky thing that sounds like nonsense, but they're promising me it's true and they show, show me a study that looks pretty compelling, actually. Wow, you know, there's a study here that seems to be the real deal. Interesting. But it still seems a little too good to be true. Hmm. Well, I'll say, okay, okay, but I hold off on absolute acceptance. Hold off. There's nothing wrong. That's one thing I stress in the book, another important point. It's okay to say, I don't know. It's okay to withhold your, a conclusion until you get more evidence, until you give it some time. Let it sink in. There, there's far too much uh, urgency. People feel this false sense of urgency where they always have to say, okay, I'll make up my mind. Uh, yeah, I believe, or no, I don't believe. No, sometimes you say, I'm not sure. I don't know. It's fine to say, I don't know. Those are beautiful words. Embrace them. There's nothing to be ashamed of. When you, when you don't know something and you say, I don't know, you're being honest, okay? <laughs> when you say something is a miracle, okay, you're not being honest, okay? Something happened, you don't know what it is, and you're applying, you're, you're transferring some sort of a, a supernatural, magical belief onto that event when you really don't know what it is, okay? A mystery is not an answer. It's okay to not know everything. I think that that is a beautiful point, that uh, I, the I don't know, the admission of ignorance is something that a lot of people are afraid of doing. Uh, I remember, uh, again, going back to anecdote land here, uh, going through my education and being startled when I went into um, college for the first time from high school because that may very well be the first time I was presented on a regular basis with that as a response from my professors. And it, it blew my mind because, of course, when you're in high school, you're working with people who have a, a bachelor's degree in their subject area and are then you know, a minor in um, pedagogy, and they will teach according to what it is. And then when you get up to the college level, these are people who are, are scientists or, or, well, they have a PhD in their field. Not, I guess not everything is a science, uh, but they uh, are experts by by definition in the subject area that they're teaching. And yet, I heard I don't know and admissions of ignorance and people saying, 
Well, I'm not sure what the answer is to that, but thank you for asking. I'll get back to you with this, you know, something. I'll look into that and get back to you in our next class. Far more regularly than I ever remember hearing in in high school level. I think that uh, there's a a fair amount of honesty with coming or becoming more and more educated on a particular subject as you realize how much you don't know about it. And uh, I think that if more people were a little bit less afraid of saying I don't know, uh, we'd uh, have a lot fewer of these superstitions and uh, weak skeptical beliefs out there. Yep. I wanted to touch on another thing here. You mentioned Star Trek. I also am a, a Trekkie. I have to say, though, I'm uh, next generation is kind of my Trekkie uh, center. I, I dabble outside of it, but that's that's where I'm aware. Um, but I noticed in your book that uh, you, or in Think, the, your most recent book here, that you mentioned having conversations with your children and often sort of couching them in terms of Star Trek or over an episode of Star Trek. Um, that I, I'm a, a parent. I have a three-year-old and another one on the way in about two months. And I think that uh, skeptic or teaching skepticism to your children is one of the best things that we can possibly do. Of course, there's uh, the the risk in that they no longer just accept your thor or your authority um, <laughs> that uh, you kind of sometimes depend upon as a parent. But um, you also are a parent, right? Yeah. Yes. That. How old are your kids? I have a little girl just turned 13, the big 13, and my son is 16, and I have an older daughter who's out of law school now, so she's all grown up. So obviously you taught her some critical thinking yeah. <laughs> yeah. through law school. Um, so do you have any tips for, for parents uh, or teachers, anybody working with young children? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. First of all, uh, get your own head straight and strive to become a good skeptic. Lead by example. But, yeah, just... It's like anything else. It's like um, sitting them down to teach them about saving money or good study habits or don't cross the street without looking both ways. You need to sit your children down at a very, very young age, very young age. When they can talk, start. There's no reason to wait. And just start explaining to them that, you know, some things are real, some things are not. There's a difference between fiction and nonfiction. I read you stories at bed at night. Some of these, most of these are make-believe. Uh, sometimes they're real stories. How do we figure out the difference? And, and you need to, more, more than any, I'd say more than any skill or techniques or anything like that, you just need to uh, impress upon them how beautiful it is to have an independent mind, to be an independent thinker, and to not, not feel so, so uh, chained to the herd. Like you, you have to go along with what everybody else is doing, no matter how crazy it is. Because if you can, if you can put that in your child, and they go off into the world, I, I believe they're much safer. They're going to be, they're going to be uh, set up for a better life because they're less likely to become a victim to, you know, con artists or crazy people out there that want to take advantage of them. So you know, you want to turn your children into thinkers, thinking human beings. That's the best thing you can do as a parent. It really is. It really is because you can't teach them. You know, with my kids, I can't say, "Okay, son, don't believe in homeopathic medicine because it's silly. It's just water." Okay, that's one thing we got out of the way. But guess what? There's 950 million more medical quackery claims out there. I don't have time to go through each one, but if I can teach him to have a radar, have a filter that he automatically, this, this gauntlet in his brain that everything must run through and survive to convince him that it's real or true, if I can do that for him or my daughters, then I, I've, done, I've done a wonderful service for them because I ain't going to be there. They're going to be on their own. And so they need to be good skeptics. Otherwise, they're, you know, they're at risk. It's a terrible thing. It's one of the most... You know, I, I'm not, I don't want to be mean to parents, but it is probably, it, it definitely is uh, one of the uh, most common areas of neglect, outright childhood neglect. When you, when you teach your child by example and by your words to be a passive believer, to just accept what your culture teaches you is true without questioning, without embracing doubt, when you allow that to happen to your children, man, you have, you have done them a huge disservice. I, I think that's a, a beautiful point, um, and I, I love that you also discussed in your book here um, the, the social consequences that can sometimes come along with being a critical thinker and being 
open to these things. And it's something, you know, of course, the children deal with a lot of the uh, the greatest amount of uh, very, very harsh social situations. Um, elementary school, as we all know, is absolutely brutal. But uh, it takes a fair amount of confidence um, and teaching kids to to continue to question and challenge things. I love the, the quote from your book here. Um, it says, uh, remember that you're not rude for doing nothing more than asking people to explain, defend, or prove a belief that they are trying to talk you into accepting. Uh, I I think that uh, when people are challenging you with a, a a belief or trying to get you to believe it, that is one thing, um, and, and that is certainly absolutely true. Uh, but there is a, a fair amount of... Uh, the social perception, as, as we talked about earlier, the know-it-all feeling that comes if you challenge a belief that they're simply professing. Um, and, of course, with what you do in your writing, um, the, that uh, comes into play. Have you personally struggled um, or suffered any major uh, consequences for what you write about? Um, I've had some kind of weird threats and stuff like that, but not, nah, I mean, nothing I couldn't handle, you know, nothing. I, I've probably been ostracized a little bit here and there, but nothing I couldn't have. I'm an introvert anyway, so it's like I'm, I'm fine being alone, you know. I don't have that I don't have that deep need to constantly be surrounded by people who are patting me on the back or something like that. I'm fine just hanging out in the library by myself with a stack of books, you know. So I'm okay that way, but um, yeah, overall, overall it's been fine. I, I think part of the reason is that once people actually read my books, you know, I almost almost every time, the people who attack me or come at me hard, don't they haven't read anything I've written. They're just going off some, you know, just judging me by the cover or whatever. Because if you actually read my books and you, you listen to me speak, you know I'm the kind of guy who doesn't try. I'm not even interested in debating you or having an argument with you. It doesn't turn me on to beat you in an argument because I, you know, I don't need it for my own well-being. That doesn't make me, you know, doesn't make my day to beat somebody up intellectually. I want to help people. I'm my my brand of skepticism is not a slap in the face. It's a helping hand up. You know, I'm trying to help people. So, what I normally do is approach people with questions more than declaring, you know, that I know what's right. Because, hey, guess what? I don't know everything, and I also I always try to whether it's whether it's psychics or ESP or medical quackery or religions or anything, whenever I'm with someone, when I'm face to face with someone who clearly has a, a deep emotional investment in it, and they feel passionate about it, and I'm in danger of upsetting them and maybe making them angry or whatever, I always try to reposition the whole dynamic. I try to tell them and make it clear to them, and it's true, I'm not playing games with them, it's true. I say, look, you know, Let's be, let's be clear about something. You and I are not butting heads here. We're not having an argument. I don't even care if you want to have an argument. We're not going to. Because guess what? You and I are on the same side here. We are both trying to get to what's real or true. Right? You want to know. You're, you say your claim is real. You say Bigfoot really is out there. I don't think he is. But you know what? If he is, I want to know about it. And guess what? If he's not out there, don't you want to know about that so you can stop wasting all your time? You know, and that applies to Bigfoot, gods, whatever. And so I try to get us on the same side, right? and so we're looking in the same direction together rather than just, you know, slamming heads. Because when you make people angry, it just, it just makes them more, you know, more entrenched. It makes them more committed and more stubborn about it. So I always try to keep encounters as friendly as possible, as positive as possible. And even if they walk away still saying, oh, you know, that's ridiculous, guy. You don't know what you're talking about. I know that many, many times I have planted seeds of thought that may take, you know, months or years to germinate. But in many cases, they do. They do. And that's good. You know, I've done, I've done something, you know, nice for that person. If I've, I've, like I said, planted a seed of thought that can help them maybe see things more clearly long after I'm gone out of their life and moved on. So yeah, you can all, I've, I've been around some pretty rough characters in talking about these you know, touchy subjects. And yet, I've, I've always managed to, to you know, sidestep the, uh, the aggression and, and do a little mental jiu-jitsu. You know? So it's, it's, not, it's not absolutely uh, 
you know, it doesn't doesn't have to be negative. It really doesn't. I, I've proven that over the years. You can be positive with this stuff. And I think many times it's 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 fantastic when you are positive about it and respectful of other people because that helps to win them over to what you're trying to get them to see. And that's that is skepticism good for you, man? I'm not trying to, you know, sign you up and take 10% of your income. I'm trying to pass on some knowledge here that is good for you. That's all. It's free, you know? <laughs> Well, guy, I only have two more things really to uh, to cover with you, um, and uh, I guess I'll I'll save the the obvious one for last. But uh, the the first thing I wanted to say is uh, I love in your book, um, I, or in your books, how you you cover things not just in sort of a philosophical sense, but you you tie them to a way that makes them relevant to the the person. I mean, even just now you were talking about belief in Bigfoot, which seems uh, to be a rather odd thing to be incredibly relevant to a person but you said you know it didn't just say you shouldn't believe it it's well, don't you want to make sure you're not wasting your time and I love that in think you talk quite a bit about the other things that people do waste I mean specifically you bring up also the the tithing or the people you know Benny Hinn getting every loose nickel out of people uh, I think uh, I, I shouldn't say I think I am really impressed with the way that you tie in the the real motivating factors for why this is important to to people. Um, is there anything else that uh, it really sort of springs to mind when you, you talk about? Uh, I, I mean, setting aside some of the the real out there um, weak skepticism, anything else that really motivates you to to help people use skepticism more in their daily life uh, and get things um, working in their favor more often? Yeah, it, it's uh, too often. You know, guys like you and I might think of this all as just an intellectual game that, you know, we're just tackling these people who are making these radical claims. But there really is a real nitty-gritty, down, down-to-earth, practical side to all this because you can apply skeptical thinking to business investments, um, career choices, you know, uh, who you date. You, there's all kinds of applications. It's, it literally is. Uh, the best thing you can do for yourself because if you're thinking like a scientist, if you're looking for evidence, if you're questioning conclusions, if you're willing to run tests and experiments, if you're, if you're willing to do these things in one way or another in your daily life, man, you, you are going to come out ahead in the long run. You really are. So don't think it's just all an intellectual exercise about, you know, uh, what's up with the Bermuda Triangle. No, it's not. It's about everything you do in your life because you when someone talks to you when a salesman talks to you and you're thinking of buying a washing machine okay there are biases going on in your head you're looking at the guy's shoes and his tie and it may influence whether or not you buy the super duper deluxe washing machine or the economy washing machine I mean you gotta be aware of these things you know it costs you money when your child wants to go to this college instead of that college. You need to analyze what's going on in her head. Why does she want to do that? And why are you leaning towards this other college? What's going on? You know, what, what is going on in our heads? Because that's why so, so much of my book, Think, is not just, it's not just about extraordinary claims. It's about human brain biology, you know? <laughs> and because, it, when, like, like I said, when you don't understand how your eyes how your memory, how these things are working every day of your life. If, when you are just clueless and you don't really know how fallible memory is or your vision, how easily it is to be fooled by what's really right in front of your face, if you don't understand, if you don't have a clue about these things, you, it's, like walking, it's like walking around with the lights turned off, you know, half, half your day. I mean, how safe is that? How practical is that? How efficient is that? You know, it's not. So yeah, skeptical thinking is for everyone. And even if you have, you know, I, I won't skirt around the issue, even if your religion is the big one, even if you're very religious and you say, there's no way I'm letting go of my religion. I love being at church or at my mosque and I love being around the people. There's no way. You know, the tradition means too much to me. It gives me this, these warm feelings of comfort and I'm just not letting it go. I'm not even going to go there. To those people I say, okay, fine then don't go there. But you know what? Do yourself a favor. Become a good skeptic in every other aspect of your life, okay? Even if you can't achieve absolute consistency, that's fine, because a little skepticism 
is a hell of a lot better than no skepticism, okay? And a lot of skepticism is a lot better than a little skepticism. So as much as you can, as much as you can muster, do it. Skepticism is good for you. Your point there about sales is a fantastic one. I, I can say from my personal experience, having worked in sales, that uh, if you're if you're not aware of the um, psychological forces that are in play in sales, you can be absolutely certain, at least, that the person selling to you is. They've, they've been taught these things, because that is a huge part of any sales education program, teaching people, uh, I mean, all sorts of things, mirroring and, and any kind of thing you can imagine. They've been taught how to manipulate you with the way that they look, the way that you think, and, and all of these biases. So that's, that's a great, very practical example. Um, so I well I I don't want to take any more of your time. I I want to say thank you for coming on. And before I, I let you go, this is the the last question that I saved here. Is uh of course you um are not an old man. You have a uh, a thirteen year old here. So a lot of life uh, and a lot of things to do. What are you working on now? What's the next book that we're gonna see? Yeah, here? a couple of projects in the works. Um, the one I'm really focused on right now, excited about, is actually a science fiction novel. It's um you know I'm changing gears here, trying fiction. Uh, I've got a hundred thousand words in the can, and I'm going through the re revision process now, and uh, it's it's been cool. It's a cool ride. It's a completely different kind of writing, and I'm, I've really enjoyed it. It's um, stretching my brain in new ways. You know, I love it. I really love. It. I have no idea if this will ever be published. You know, <laughs> but sometimes you got to go for it and do what you want to do. So I'm I'm taking a shot at it. Yeah, and I have um, my next nonfiction book. There's a couple. I'm I'm you know, tinkering with, but it's probably going to be one about human divisions, how how made up divisions cause so many problems for us, and they're so prominent and important in our lives that many people don't realize that these are things we just pulled out of our butts. They're just made up. You know, I'm talking about national borders, um, racial divisions, uh, religious divisions, um, and uh, other things, and that book... Um, I really want to show people and convince people from a scientific, reality-based perspective that, you know, we we really should feel a lot more like one big family sharing this one planet. As corny as that sounds, you know, I'm not just saying, rah, rah, let's all hold hands. I'm saying, I'm saying rah, rah, let's all hold hands because it's logical, scientific, and it makes sense, and it's who we really are. We're just pretending to be this this, you know, diced up, chopped up species that is, so, you know, so diff we're all so different from one another, you know, because of languages and music and the kind of pants we wear or whatever. So hopefully it's a book that can do some more good, bring us bring us a little closer together. I look forward to that. I, I love your uh, your race and reality book and the book, uh, I think it was in 50 Popular Beliefs that uh, people think are true. You brought, uh, you had the uh, example of the uh, Haitian friend of yours that changes race by getting on an airplane. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was an amazing story. My wife is a uh, social studies teacher and she actually uh, uses that. She has her students read that um, uh, to uh, uh, sort of help explain this point. And sometime in the future we're going to tackle the, the issues of race and, and things, racism um, and the other uh, associated prejudices uh, there are, are I guess they're with. So uh, at that point, I will certainly contact you and uh, have you come on again. Uh, this time I'll give you a little bit more advanced notice. Um, so thank you again for coming with uh, such short notice to be uh, a guest on my show here. And thank you very much. I look forward to uh, everything that you're working on in the future as well. And uh, let me be, um, or, or put this officially on the record, that uh, if you're looking for somebody to uh, give you a review of that novel before it hits the publishers. I'm more than happy to offer my services. So, All right. um, thank you. Thank you for joining us. And uh, again, this has been Inspiring Doubt and Guy P. Harrison, uh, author of the new, er, the newest book, Think, and several other ones. Fifty popular beliefs that people think are true. Fifty questions or fifty simple questions for every Christian. Fifty reasons people give for believing in a God and race and reality. I can't uh, recommend any of them uh, enough. They, they're all fantastic books and worth every moment 
that you can spend. And what's great is they're quick, easy reads. So I think that uh, everybody should spend some time reading the books by um, you, uh, Mr. Guy P. Harrison. Thank you again for joining us. Well, thanks, man. Thank you for having me. It was a pleasure. Great questions. Enjoyed it. All right. Have a great day. Okay.